We welcome everyone to the People's Forum. This is our space is a movement incubator, a space where we encourage, build, and educate on the need for anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism in our times. We work with movements and people's organizations in the United States and all over the world to forward this agenda, a people's agenda for peace, justice, and dignity in our lifetimes. We're honored. We're honored to convene this momentous meeting together with the Answer Coalition. Because the time is now to say no to this war. The U.S. empire, its friends and allies in NATO, have been manufacturing a consent. They think that with $91 billion, countless flags, warmongering, they can convince all of the planet to agree with their latest proxy war. We are saying, no to NATO expansion. We're saying no to this proxy war. We're saying no to the U.S. government's policy of bleeding Russia through the lives of countless Ukrainians. We are not going to wait for nuclear war. We are not going to wait for global famine. We are not going to wait for a further energy crisis. Why? Because we understand very clearly, we see very clearly that the only group of people who benefit from this war, the only people who benefit from there not being peace negotiations, continue to be the elites in Washington. We definitely have a collective responsibility to remember and to build and to act and to mobilize and to organize because we will not allow those war criminals in Washington with their crocodile tears, acting like they care about the Ukrainian people, when we know very well that they're actually willing to sacrifice every Ukrainian alive in order to accomplish their war against Russia. Let us not be confused. We now want to present, joining us online, a dear friend, a friend of the People's Forum, but I say a friend of all peace activists around the world, Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink, along with Jody Evans, and a longtime activist against U.S. imperialism. We welcome Medea on screen. <laughs> be with you all today. I'm sorry I'm not there in person for this very important meeting. I'd like to talk about some uh, issues of the U.S. politics right now and how topsy-turvy everything is, how confusing it is, how hard it is to wrap our head around the political scene about Ukraine. For example, let's look at the fact that the most cautious people in the by the administration right now are not the civilians, they are the military. The military, like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, who said that the Ukrainians have gotten about all they're gonna be able to get. There's a stalemate. They should seize the moment and go to negotiations. Uh, then there are the really hawkish members of the Biden administration, like President Biden himself, uh, like the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, who instead of talking about negotiations has been traveling around the world trying to uh, gin up more weapons for Ukraine. Uh, they have not talked to their counterparts about trying to stop this war. And they seem to be pushing the illusion that the Ukrainians can get back every inch of territory that the Russians occupy, including all of Donbass and all of Crimea and that they should fight to the last Ukrainian to get that. And then you have the political parties. On the one hand, you have the Democratic Party, 
where when the $40 billion was passed for Ukraine, not one Democrat stood up to question it. And you have another $37 billion that the administration has asked for and will probably be voted on very soon. And I think we can take bets that not one Democrat will stand up against that massive amount of money uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the all We also have the issue of uh, the Democrats, the 30 of them who signed on to this very, very modest letter saying, thank you so much, Biden, for all the help you have given Ukraine. And we in Congress have uh, given all of this economic and military aid. And now we should pair that with negotiations. An extremely mild letter, only 30 Democrats signed on. And as soon as they did, all hell broke loose. And with, within 24 hours, they had either removed their names from the letter uh, or the letter after it had been signed, sealed and delivered to President Biden was then withdrawn. Quite a remarkable blowback against people who were merely calling for negotiations from the Democratic Party side. In the meantime, on the Republican side, while most of the Republicans are indeed the hawks they always are, like Mitch McConnell in the Senate calling for more and more weapons to Ukraine, there is an element of the Republican Party, mostly on the extreme right wing, who voted against the $40 billion, who complained about the U.S. war in Ukraine and this uh, never-ending, unwinnable war, and who said that they were feeling pressure from their base uh, to vote against that uh, enormous tranche of money. Uh, it's not only some of the more uh, extreme members of the uh, Congress, uh, it's also people like Donald Trump who have been going around in his rallies and on social media. And then when he announced that he was running for president, uh, saying things like, this can end up in a nuclear war in which all of humanity will be annihilated. We've got to sit down on the table. I could be the negotiator. If I were in office, this war would never have happened because I would have talked to Putin. And it's important to understand that Donald Trump is a savvy politician, that he puts his finger up in the air, sees which way the wind is blowing, and then moves in that direction. So obviously, there is a lot of sentiment out there that this war is not in the national interests of the American people. Uh, so uh, you see the uh, right wing and the, the Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson from Fox being the ones who are today the peacemakers, where the party of war is clearly uh, the Democratic Party. Of course, let's not say that the part, Republicans are a peace party, but that certain elements of the Republican Party are understanding uh, that this war cannot be won on the battleground. And so where does that put us today? I think it puts us uh, right where we know we need to be, which is we don't have a movement that is strong enough to push both of the parties uh, and to push the Biden administration into the right position. And that's why today's meeting is so important. That's why it's so important to gather up our forces and to extend them to get the people in the environmental movement to recognize that this war has only led to the production of more dirty energy, giving a green light to the oil, the gas, the coal, the nuclear weapon uh, war, uh, the nuclear power producers uh, to say, uh, that we have to make up for the sanctioning of Russian energy and uh, produce more dirty energy that U.S. companies will benefit from. Um, we have to get the environmental movement to work with us to say that this war and all wars are so destructive of the environment and they have to stand with us for peace. Uh, we also are calling on the faith-based movement to say war is immoral, all wars are immoral, and they need to come with us and call for a Christmas truce like happened during World War I. Uh, so we are calling on faith-based leaders around this country to join the Pope who has said, uh, we must get all sides to the table. And uh, of course, people who are working for things like healthcare for all in the United States, uh, a free college education, all of those people have to recognize 
that as we are going to spend over a hundred billion dollars in less than a year on this war, uh, we must make people understand that that money could be going for needs at home, and of course, could be going to address the climate challenge that really threatens our entire future uh, as a planet. Um, so I just want to end by saying thank you to the organizers. Thank you to those who are listening. Um, we do have a coalition called peaceinukraine.org that you can join either as individuals or as organizations. Let's build this movement. Let's demand ceasefire and negotiations now. Thank you. We are indeed building the movement. We are not stopping today. We are not stopping ever. For as long as NATO exists, for as long as U.S. imperialism continues to threaten the planet, we will be in movement. We now want to welcome someone who, when I first joined the anti-war movement, was a big reference. He was one of the few anti-war intellectuals who could clearly define and denounce imperialism for what it was. A man who has often been ridiculed and attacked by the ruling elites, yet is loved by the masses of people around the world. And that is our dear friend and comrade, Noam Chomsky. Uh, <clears throat> let's start with a truism. A war can end in one of two ways. One way is that one side surrenders, the other sets the terms of surrender. The way, there's a negotiated settlement. That's one truism. Let's turn to a second truism. In a negotiated settlement, Neither side achieves its maximal goals. Each side agrees to live with it as the best of existing alternatives. These observations seem simple enough, but they actually merit some thought. Let's take a look at U.S. policy, openly, repeatedly announced, no ambiguity continue the war in order to severely weaken Russia, so severely that it will not be able to undertake aggression again. Well, let's think what that means. Take it literally, which is, I presume, how Russia understands it. Literally, it means U.S. policy is to impose conditions on the defeated Russia, which are even harsher than those imposed on Germany at Versailles a century ago. Those weren't harsh enough. They didn't prevent German aggression. You can think what that means and how any Russian leaders would interpret it. Uh, U.S. policy is adopted almost reflexively by the United Kingdom and with various kinds of wavering by the NATO leadership generally. Well, all of this has consequences. One consequence is plainly bars negotiations. There is actually an official argument supporting this stance. It's that the war should go on until Ukraine is in a better bargaining position. Of course, there's an option left understood, unsaid, but understood, maybe in a worse bargaining position. Well, this stance, you don't say that, of course. This stance reflects nothing more than a commitment to continuing the war as long as it benefits the United States by weakening Russia severely and establishing the U.S. more firmly as the world dominant power. Well, by now, it's also 
openly recognized uh, that continuing the war provides a valuable opportunity for the United States and its allies to test new equipment and advance techniques of war fighting about which they're very proud. Uh, also unsaid is that these plans <clears throat> are based on a ghastly gamble. So the hope that if Putin is defeated, he'll pack up his bags, quietly slink away to oblivion, maybe worse. The gamble that he won't resort to the conventional weapons that everyone agrees he has to devastate Ukraine with consequences that are all too easy to imagine. It's conventional weapons. We should bear in mind that almost all the talk about nuclear weapons is in the West. Russia has occasionally enunciated the standard doctrine of nuclear powers. If its survival is threatened, might resort to nuclear weapons. Uh, the United States actually has a far more expansive doctrine. That's an important matter, but I'll put it aside here. Looking, continuing with the facts, uh, U.S. and U.K. military analysts anticipated in advance of the invasion that Russia would find their kind of war. Uh, the U.S. British kind of war style of their ally Israel against defenseless Gaza is to go at once for the jugular, shock and awe, at once destroy communications, energy, water supplies, sewage treatment, transportation, anything that keeps a society function, functioning. Russia didn't do that much to the surprise of U.S. and British analysts. The ghastly gamble is that Russia won't descend to the U.S.-U.K. style of war. That gamble is already beginning to fail. Putin has recently begun to imitate the warrior states of the West. His recent attacks on Kiev Targets have been bitterly condemned, rightly so, condemned by people who had little or no objection when their side carried out the atrocities on a much greater scale, in fact. But let's put hypocrisy aside. The crucial matter is the ghastly gamble, the willingness to gamble that Russia will accept defeat passively and not react in the manner of the Western warrior states. That's the clear and explicit meaning of the official policy of continuing the war in order to severely weaken Russia. These are all virtual truisms. Let's look then at some facts. Russia's Criminal invasion of Ukraine is taking a terrible toll. The longer it continues, the more severe the toll. Ukraine, of course, is the primary victim, but the impact reaches far beyond. It includes millions facing starvation in countries relying on grain and fertilizer from the region, and also fuel that's being diverted to Europe and the rich countries. It includes the whole world facing the possibility that a confrontation between the world's two huge nuclear powers will drift out of control, leading to terminal war. It's all too easy to sketch plausible scenarios. Actually, we just witnessed one of the many possibilities a couple of days ago, when a Ukrainian anti-aircraft craft missile accidentally hit Polish territory. Next time, it could be a Russian missile attacking supply lines to Ukraine, as the Western warrior states 
would not hesitate to do in comparable circumstances. And just to be honest, comparable circumstances are unimaginable because far short of that, they would have resorted to far more extreme violence. Well, another grim consequence of the perpetuation of the conflict is reversal of the limited efforts to deal with the most severe crisis that has ever arisen in human history. The destruction of the environment that sustains life no need to elaborate on the severity of the threat. Anyone with eyes open understands that we have a narrow window in which we can carry out measures to avert an indescribable catastrophe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has partially closed that narrow window. It has led to sharp increase in fossil fuel production, cut off from cheap Russian gas. It's now importing vast amounts of far more expensive, far more polluting, liquefied natural gas from the chief producers of this lethal substance, US in the lead. They're pricing poor countries out of the market with terrible impact. Sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline locks this destructive system in place. And interestingly, that sabotage is another topic we're not permitted to talk about in free societies because of what we'd immediately conclude. New investments are being made in and fuel in fields that can be exploited for decades in for fossil fuel production. Profits of the fossil fuel companies are exploding about as fast as those for weapons producers as new prospects open for destroying human life on Earth. The euphoria in executive offices is unconstrained as they propel us to the final precipice. The longer the war continues, the greater will be the toll, reaching perhaps to the end of organized human life. Speak of the vast number of species we are wantonly destroying. That, of course, is assuming that we can ward off the option of destroying ourselves more expeditiously with nuclear war. It's a possibility that is now being casually discussed as if it were an option. It's an indescribable descent to a state beyond insanity. Well, I'm sorry if these remarks seem hyperbolic. They're not. All of this tells us that every possible path to a diplomatic settlement should be pursued in accord with the wishes of almost the entire world, including the core of Europe, including, for example, three quarters of the population of Germany. I won't run through the record. Prior to the invasion, there were opportunities for diplomatic settlement within the general framework of the Minsk agreements. As recently as last April, Ukraine-Russia negotiations were proceeding under Turkish auspices. The two Western warrior states, US and Britain, both registered opposition to them. Interest in diplomacy is so limited that there's almost no coverage. So we do not know how significant a factor this was in the collapse of the negotiations. As the conflict persists, positions harden, the options for diplomacy narrow, the ghastly gamble becomes even more ominous. There is no time for delay. Thank you, Noam. 
excellent message from Noam Chomsky. We cannot continue to wait as the threat of nuclear war looms over humanity. As we speak, U.S. nuclear bombers stationed in Europe are somehow a notices away from pulverizing their so-called Russian enemy. At the same time, as we speak, 345 million people around the planet face hunger. This number increased from 222 million just since March. In this ghastly gamble of what Noam Chomsky speaks about, who is it that the U.S. ruling class is willing to sacrifice? They constantly talk about sacrifice. Biden says the American people are willing to sacrifice in order to support this war in Ukraine. The problem is, are we actually going to let him sacrifice the planet? No. Are we going to allow them to sacrifice the Ukrainian people? No. Are we going to allow them to sacrifice the people of Africa, Asia, and Latin America? No. We refuse in the name of peace. We refuse to accept their conditions and their terms. We are beyond honored. I am so excited to have Jill Stein in the house. Because Jill Stein is, I mean, I don't even know if I can call her a politician because I, I, I don't want to insult her name. <laughs> but she has been someone who has, in multiple political spaces and debates in the political arena, has demonstrated a new type of politics, a different type of politics. In her time, she's been twice presidential candidate for the Green Party in the United States. And quite often, I would say she's used to it now, she is a lone voice for peace. She's often a lone voice for what is rational for what is just. Jill Stein, we're honored to have you here. This is a uh, I'm so honored to be here. I, I feel speechless from having heard my own thoughts. I don't know if you're all feeling this too, but it's like this is such a reality check here that's going on. It's really great to see that we are not crazy. You know, <laughs> we really are telling the truth. We really are pointing the way forward. For those whose hair is my color, we've been through this many times. We've seen this certainly since Vietnam. We really cut our teeth on what it means to fight manufactured consent. It is not easy when you are facing wall to wall saturation, propaganda, 24-7. We know what that's about. But we also, and, you know, and we went through this certainly in Iraq, big time, weapons of mass destruction that weren't there, Saddam Hussein's, you know, horrific abuses, the yellow cake that also wasn't, I mean, all these myths, one after the other. So, for those of us who've been through this many times, some of us at least have really learned to approach the prevailing propaganda with a lot of skepticism. You have to assume it's not true until proven otherwise, instead of just accepting being powerless, being hopeless, and entrusting our fearless political leaders and their security state to direct us forward. We've seen where that goes. And in many ways right now, we are sort of facing the logical conclusion of a political and economic system 
which is run whole hog for the benefit of the elites. It's no exaggeration to say that this is whatever you want to call it, end-stage capitalism, end-stage empire, the colonialist, uh, uh, white supremacist, male uh, supremacy project, you know, whatever you want to call it, this is it. This is where it goes. This is unacceptable, unsustainable, unsurvivable. And the chickens have come home to roost here, back here in the seat of the empire. The chickens have really come home to roost in the struggles of the everyday American people, working people, and the poor who are growing by the millions in the U.S. and around the world. We see a few billionaires. We see the expansion of the billionaire class. They've added some, I don't know, hundreds to their ranks, while hundreds of millions have joined the ranks of poverty, severe and abysmal poverty. So, you know, this system just doesn't last. And we are all in the crossfire. It's not just the people of Ukraine who are being uh, set up to the last person, to the last man, woman, and child. Their lives are being expended. We are all a part of this vast uh, exercise of unaccountable and abusive power on the part of economic and political elites. And we are saying no more. The buck stops. And, and it's just music to my ears to hear what uh, everybody has been saying here. I want to, you know, inject, um, uh, what should I say, confidence and power into our position. <clears throat> As Alice Walker has said, <clears throat> excuse me, and others before her, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. It's really amazing how much power we have, even on this issue. Thank you. Um, Gallup, the polling organization, excuse me, has been doing monthly polls where they ask people, you know, what, what is the most critical issue? What is the most important issue to you? If you look at Congress, you'd think, well, obviously the most important issue is Ukraine. It is weapons sales and production. It is the military industrial complex. That's what Democrats and Republicans agree on. That is their funding priority, not funds to expand the uh, child tax credit, not funds for health care as a human right when 70,000 people every year are dying from lack of health insurance. And that's on top of the COVID deaths where one out of every three we're linked to a lack of health insurance. It's not the housing emergency that is just exploding before our very eyes. There's something like 11 million people right now who are facing potential imminent eviction. And that is certainly growing. Those figures are old because what is being hit by inflation, it's not only energy costs and food costs, it's also housing, big time. So we're not funding that. No, to look at Congress, what we have to fund, and this is very clear and very explicit, what we have to fund are a new generation of nuclear weapons, are more tanks for, uh, for Ukraine, it's more armaments. That's their number one priority. But to look at this Gallup poll, what you see actually, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the, um, the issues that people rate as number one are economic issues. It's economic security, it's inflation, it's the cost of living, it's 60 some percent of people who are living pay to paycheck to paycheck. You know, it's the, econ it's the growing economic desperation which is at the top. And next to that, it is the, what should we say, it's the betrayal of our governing officials. <laughs> That's actually like the number two official. Uh, uh, that's the number two rank, is how outrageous we are being governed and how abusively we are being governed. That's the number two issue. So you don't hear about this, you know, in, uh, on MSNBC. You're not hearing about what's important to people. You're just hearing, 
kind of the, uh, uh, the Defense Department talking points. That's what's important to them. But where does Ukraine and Russia rank? Well, it's about 1% of people who say that this is the leading and key issue. So that should really uh, tell us something. And those of us you know, who've been through this before, who watch how the military industrial media complex really comes on you know, with all guns blazing, and we're supposed to be accepting their version of reality, which is just totally turned on its head, that begins to crack and that fades right away. We can smell a rat from the very beginning. This has been a rat from the beginning. And this one is falling apart, I must say, much faster than the other uh, propaganda efforts have, uh, have, uh, have really fallen apart. And as Noam Chomsky was saying, you know, to actually look at real deep polling across the world or even in the EU, there is not support for this war. There's much greater support for actually uh, negotiations and a peaceful settlement ASAP. So we should have you know, all the confidence and faith in our heartfelt intuitions. Uh, as Claudio was saying, above all, we are human beings here and we are listening to our hearts and we are listening to the hearts of our fellow humans, regardless of what side of any border they happen to live on. Uh, we know really what the story is. And the story is that all of us are in the crosshairs right now. We're all in the crosshairs. I want to expand on that just a little bit because no doubt we are going to be having this conversation at our Thanksgiving dinners. And we're all not going to be on the same side if your family is out like mine. Um, and we have a job to do. No pressure, but like Claudia was saying, we have a collective responsibility to remember and to tell the truth and to share truth and justice with the people we are in community with and in family with. And that is going to uh, really, that will be the leading edge of the change, just like being out in the street will be the leading edge of change. Uh, really using all of the tools uh, at our disposal to throw the bums out from elected office. That will be part of the change that also needs to happen. But I want to talk a little bit about how this is hurting us. We at the center of the empire who are supposed to be like all for this. I want to just say a few things about um, the many ways that this is hurting. And let's see, maybe we will try to show a picture or two. Um, let's not seem to be advancing. Okay, great. All right, so this one, you may be familiar with this. This is just the diagram of our budget, uh, the congressional budget. And just, you know, in a glance, picture tells a thousand words here. You see the military budget. This was, I think, one or two years ago, where it was a mere 752 billion. It's now actually quite a bit more. It's about 700 and I think 40 billion, which is proposed for the coming fiscal year. So it's growing, I'm sorry, 840. Did I say seven? It's 840. So it's actually growing by leaps and bounds. And this doesn't even tell the whole story because lots of pieces are kind of buried where you won't see them, like nuclear weapons development. Where is that? That is in energy and the environment. Why? Because it's destroying the environment. Maybe that's why they're putting it there. I don't know. But. There are tens of billions of dollars that are buried there. There's Homeland Security. There's the VA. Why do we have all these health issues to deal with for our veterans who've been put on the front lines, you know, having very little choice in the matter? That, too, is a sequela of these wars. So it's actually a trillion dollars a year. It's already a trillion dollars a year. It's getting bigger. And it's more like two-thirds of the budget now. It's not a mere uh, 50 percent. It's, it's way more than that. And you can see, what does that leave? It just leaves a pittance for everything else. Um, and this is just, again, the money behind the madness. This goes a long way to say why it is that all these crazy things are happening. They are being funded. Next slide. Um, so you'll see on the bottom left, endless war is getting about a trillion a year. Social programs, if you add them all up, they're getting about half that amount. And any one department is just getting a 
tiny a, a pittance. That is not okay. It's not okay that it's half as much as military fen, uh, funding. And then the climate collapse that we hear so much lip service to from uh, the Democratic Party in particular, what is it actually doing about that climate crisis? Well, now it has completely gone into reverse gear on the climate crisis because of the war. As previous speakers alluded to, that is one of the biggest um, uh, you know, victims of the war is that it provides a perfect excuse not only for war profiteering, but also for fossil fuel uh, profiteering. And it becomes an opportunity not only to use more fuel, because right, we have to drop a lot of bombs and fly a lot of airplanes and do all that stuff, um, but also we have to build new fossil fuel depots. And we have the sanctions really to thank for this. Most of the disruption of energy supplies around the world is not due to the war, it's mostly due to US sanctions. So we don't even have to wait to stop the war. We could just end the sanctions right now and then guess what? Most of the hunger crisis and most of the fuel crisis goes away like that. We have the power to do that. <laughs> We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. And the 350 some million people now who are facing food insecurity, 50 million of them who are facing acute starvation, that doesn't have to be the case. With the flick of a pen, the food and the fuel could begin to flow again, even before we've gone through the difficult process of negotiating a settlement we could have a ceasefire also with the flick of a pen. So this is a war of choice. This is a catastrophe of choice. And it's not just Putin's invasion. Putin's invasion was the latest response to a buildup and an escalation of mutual attacks that have been going on at least since 2014 with the US support for the coup in the Maidan where the right wing and Nazis had a very major role to play because they put their hands around the throat of everybody involved and they don't take no for an answer. You may remember that uh, Zelensky who now seems really kind of over the edge, he was elected on a peace platform. He was elected to implement the uh, peace accords, the Minsk peace accords. So um, that's, you know, that's where we should be. Uh, that is within our reach, and that is what we should be pushing for uh, even right now. Um, let me just... The crisis of the war and the climate is not separate from the crisis of justice. And I just want to not leave that out here. Um, and this chart, I want to just take a minute to explain it because it says so much about what's going on. And what you see here going from left to right is wealth, total wealth. Uh, in the U.S., so it's going from 1989 up to almost 2020, you see wealth is growing. But where is it growing? It's growing in that blue section, which is the top 10%, and the piece above the little red line is the top 1%. So it's mainly the top 1% that is making out like bandits here. What's happening to the lower 50%? Well, the lower 50% is the brown line at the very bottom, if you can even see it. That is 2% of our wealth is distributed among the entire half of the population, which is making do with this. This, in my mind, goes a long way to explain why we are in the mess we are in, not only because everyday people are really being starved to death, literally, 
but also because power is concentrated, increasingly concentrated into the hands of a very few who purchase their politicians as usual, and between the economic and political elites, they keep generating policy to just make this worse. So that's just to include in our discussion, you know, that we have a crisis of war, we have a crisis of climate, and we have a crisis of justice. We don't solve any of them without solving all of them. And then um, I will try to wrap up because I could keep going all day here. It's just, it's really wonderful <laughs> to have you all here doing what you're doing. I want all of us to help all of us lead the charge on this because, again, no pressure, but it really is up to us. We're here because we get it. And as has been said here several times today, the clock is ticking and we don't have much time. So we really need to use every means at our disposal. Part of that is being out in the street. Part of that is also just in our conversations, um, talking to our friends and neighbors in our communities. So what is the cost of militarism? It's not only those dollars that we've been talking about. It's also that when you superpower the military, it does really crazy things. Uh, our military is completely off the charts. It's those 800 bases that we have around the world when the rest of the world has 30 of those bases all put together. Um, it's the cost of our budget. It is 68 coups and regime change uh, operations that have been instigated by the U.S. Uh, since the Second World War. According to the Congressional Research Service, we have intervened with our military 251 times in the past 20 years. 20 years, 30 years, in the past 30 years. So you get a military that's doing crazy things, and we have the, um, the commitment to nuclear weapons. And in this recent nuclear posture review, in spite of Joe Biden's promises during the campaign that he was going to adopt a policy of no first use, he basically adopted a policy as, well, yes, we, we can use nuclear weapons on a first basis when we decide. Uh, we're not going to take any of our tools off the table. And that policy is one of complete nuclear madness. I also want to mention full-spectrum dominance. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Yeah, okay. So people in this room probably know what it is. But just very briefly, full-spectrum dominance is the established official policy of the U.S. foreign policy and military establishment, which is, in to put it very simply, it's that we will dominate all spaces and all other countries. And no, we will not allow competitors to emerge militarily or economically. So this goes a long way to explain why we've had this uh, gearing up of hostilities towards both Russia and, and to China. They are not allowed. You are not allowed to become a full player on your own terms. Uh, that's basically what's going on there. And this policy, it turns out, was actually declared. How far back does it go? It actually goes back to the breakup of the Soviet Union, 1991. In 1992, the Pentagon issued its formal policy, basically that it will not tolerate the emergence of new competitors in the region of the Soviet, former Soviet Union or anywhere else. It will not tolerate uh, competitors. Uh, that are hostile, and it also won't tolerate competitors among our allies. It actually said that. I mean, it's really incredible. If this was a person, you would be sending them to a social worker. <laughs> I wish they had such a thing, you know. The UN needs a uh, social worker. Um, and as part of that exercise in full-spectrum dominance, we have been basically undermining uh, peace developments. Uh, for a long, long time, for, for decades, actually, but uh, particularly in the conflict with Ukraine. Um, and then the escalation towards the nuclear war. Um, we have been the ones who have disrupted the treaties. The U.S. of A. is the one who essentially pulled out of and destroyed virtually every nuclear treaty. This is a big problem because when you have a lot of nuclear weapons and you don't have rules for how they're being used, 
It's very easy for people to panic when they think a nuclear weapon is approaching and to just, you know, trigger the response when it's not even warranted. But in truth, the real solution here is just get rid of the nuclear weapons, all of them. And that really goes hand in hand with getting rid of our empire and our incredibly hyper-aggressive military state. It's not just the war in Ukraine. It's the whole reliance on militarism as essentially the basis of our foreign policy. That has to end. And again, the bottom line is that this comes back to us to roost. The chickens come home here to roost. And what's happening in the climate is another case in point. That just shows you how the temperature has been going up uh, from the year, whatever it is, around uh, 2000 up to current. So I won't say a lot more about that, except that the last eight years on record have been the hottest years around. Uh, I'm only showing the Colorado River here because most of us are eating the uh, food that is produced thanks to the Colorado River, which supplies half of the fruits and vegetables for the entire United States. It is 75% depleted. It is well on its way to a critical threshold where the water will not flow. So expect famine to be coming to a neighborhood near you pretty soon. This isn't something we can just sit back and allow it to go on. Same thing with the collapse of the ice sheets, which is well underway. This year, for the first time ever, rain was observed falling on Greenland and also on um, the South Pole, on Antarctica. And who knows what happens to ice when water falls on ice? It greatly accelerates the melting. So I wouldn't put great stock <coughs> excuse me, in any assurance that, oh, don't worry, you know, massive sea level rise is a long way off. I mean, it's, it's already well underway. And there are many countries who are paying the price in many forms. In Bangladesh, we've seen 33 million people have to get up and find a new place to live and a new source of food. 33 million, that's a third of the country. I mean, it's absolutely staggering. That's not from sea level rise, but that's just change in weather patterns and, and rain. So the climate has come home to roost. And I will mention 60% of animals, including mammals and uh, reptiles, uh, fish, and birds are gone, 60% just since 1970. So it's really hard, I find, to put your hands around both what's happening with the war machine and what's happening with the climate. It's like my blood pressure goes through the roof to think about any one of these and then to think about both of them. It's just, you know, it's just untenable. And it's really important to take that outrage that you get when you think about what the elites are doing to Mother Earth and humanity, it's really important that we target that into fighting because this is a fight we can win. And as Alice Walker said, the biggest way people give up power is, not, is by not knowing we have it to start with. We have it. In fact, we are not just like, you know, competitive. Peace is not just a good idea. It's actually the only way forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force myself to stop. Um, one last thing. Just I want to show this picture because this so demonstrates the connection between war and climate. Uh, fossil fuels are the, um, you know, they are the engine of war. So fossil fuel use goes way up. The military industrial complex is equivalent to like the 47th nation in the rank of fossil fuel emissions. So it's, it's substantial. It's not the whole nine yards, but it is, <clears throat> excuse me, drink here. It is a very important part uh, of the puzzle here. It's not only the fossil fuels, it's also the destruction of habitats, toxic pollution, <clears throat> 
the diversion of resources from other critical needs. There are just so many ways that these things interact. Here you just see the, uh, the graphic from, the, uh, from a project at the Boston University on the interaction of climate and war, making the point that the military has been emitting basically 257 million cars worth of emissions. So that's a lot of stuff. It goes up, and here's one happening right now, or that just happened. This is the single biggest release of fossil fuels ever on record. That is the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines, which bubbled up as methane. You may know that methane is 80 times more powerful than CO2 in terms of its climate warming impacts. So this is just routine. I mean, this is what happens in war. And who could have done this? I don't know. Who possibly could have benefited from this? Well, what's the outcome? They're building 10 new LNG terminals, liquefied natural gas terminals, in order to replace what just got blown up mysteriously by someone we can't figure out who. Um, but we are now building the replacement. Ten of these very destructive, very environmentally destructive terminals in the U.S. and ten terminals in the EU. And what does that mean? It's not only that more fossil fuels are being used, but it also means that a whole lot of new infrastructure is being built. So war is an end run around the limits and the climate cautions and things like that for the fossil fuel industry. War is a profiteering opportunity for both the fossil fuel and the weapons industry, and we're going to stop it. So with that, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and for carrying this, this incredible glorious fight forward. We are going to win, and it's wonderful to be on your team. Thank you.